Uh, today I'm going to be talking about medical management of uh, BPH. Uh, not not necessarily a specialty of mine, but you know it's something that we of course do a lot of, and so um, and it's like I said, one of those bridging uh, areas that's useful to most students and um, may even have some material that comes up on testing. Um, I so I'm going to start with uh, you know just an introduction of myself. I'm going to talk about items of, uh, you know, within this area that are useful to clinical practice. And then I'm gonna uh, talk about some things that are useful mainly on exams and that are kind of uh, technical things. Um, I'll spend most of the time in the middle there. So just an introduction to myself. Um, I uh, uh, went to Emory Medical School and uh, I went to Georgia before that for undergrad and uh, stayed on for residency here at uh, Emory and graduated in 2018. Um, so I've been in practice a couple of years. Um, luckily they were willing to keep me on and um, uh, I started a practice at Midtown. So, uh, you know, we're a small department and you know, uh, urology in general is small. And um, of course, we, you know, generally you're not gonna have bandwidth to cover all of the sites of a large kind of sprawling academic um, center like Emory Healthcare. And so we are growing though. And so um, one, of those, um, uh, one of those pieces of growth was starting this practice at Midtown. And so we're getting up to, uh, you know, uh, recruiting our fourth uh, physician and uh, our third APP here. So uh, we're getting up to speed and um, uh, I think the community's uh, welcomed us well here. And uh, as you may know, if you've you know done any uh, rotations at Midtown, it is the busiest hospital in the system in terms of ER visits and OR cases. Um, so you know it's a it's a substantial uh, operation here, and so um, you know you know just as well the urology opportunities here are great, and um, we've seen quite a variety of you know cases and and um, you know pathologies and. A lot of the other kind of adjunct or, or you know associated surgical specialties uh, that we work with you know all uh, have uh, you know we've been able to do good things with them and so uh, in terms of training at Midtown that's uh, that's to uh, to come in the future likely um, and um, you know in terms of bringing residents here but right now it's us building the practice and trying to you know lay the groundwork um, but um, initial thoughts are that, you know, that this will be a good place to experience somewhat of what it may be like to do uh, a hybrid community practice, a community academic practice. They're becoming more of those out there these days, uh, you know, as more and more urologists, as with all physicians are becoming employed, um, you know, academic centers just as well as private you know, hospital systems are expanding. And so the academic, you know, the core academic, you know, um, model doesn't necessarily fit, a, you know, a sprawling clinical practice. And so sometimes there has to be that element of folks who focus on more clinical and, uh, but, um, you know, a great, that's a great place for learning just as well, because a lot of the things that you may find that hinder education uh, you know, um, uh, you know, ironically enough, are not present in places that um, were educated, or you know, maybe the practice wasn't necessarily built, you know, on education. So, um, so it can be very helpful from a clinical repetition standpoint, and from you know, a variety uh, uh, standpoint, and so forth. Uh, any questions so far? All right, so. I'm going to talk a little bit about BPH and, and how we address it and how we go about this. A lot of the foundational kind of understanding of this can be seen uh, in a readily available, uh, um, uh, you know, um, materials through the AUA, um, both the medical student curriculum and if you're a kind of a student member or, or have access to uh, someone who is a member, you know, their core curriculum, which, um, you know, is somewhat recently developed, but very uh, becoming more and more thorough by the uh, year and um, you know very helpful so 
uh, we'll start with some definitions. Um, now these are somewhat academic because if you look at it, you know, on, you know, our system and the CPT or sorry, the ICD-10 coding system and so forth, these designations aren't necessarily as um, precise, but they are precise to us in urology. It's, a, you know, uh, it's important that you're accurate when you talk about things and, um, you know, you may see a variety of ways of describing uh, this um, pathology, whether that's benign prostatic hypertrophy, hyperplasia, of course, that's, you know, a difference in the histologic description uh, and um, enlargement. So benign prostatic enlargement, um, you know, is something that can be clinically made at the bedside, whereas you might imagine hypertrophy and hyperplasia is a presumption made on a, uh, oftentimes a presumption, uh, unless you happen to have biopsied the patient, in which case oftentimes you don't even see that uh, diagnosis necessarily. So, um, so uh, you know, uh, this is just saying that, you know, technically it all lumps in under the same diagnosis code. So um, while it's, a, you know, we talk about the definition ultimately clinically for, um, you know, when, when we practice, it's not as important necessarily. Um, bladder outlet obstruction is, is the main differentiating factor, factor actually when it comes down to um, diagnostics. And, uh, you know, you can have BPH with or without outlet obstruction. Uh, but of, of course, that in and of itself is, uh, a, is a definition that's made, uh, can also be made based on, uh, if you're accurately speaking, on a bedside exam or history. Um, but oftentimes we do still presume bladder outlet obstruction based on some of the things that we talk to the patient about. So what do we talk to the patient about or what do we hear from them? Uh, the symptoms that they might have. Okay, so we can lump them into a few categories. One is storage symptoms. Okay, this is, you know, uh, this is uh, difficulties with, let me make sure that I'm, I don't think we have a waiting room, but I want to make sure that folks are coming in. Um, so storage symptoms are difficulties in storing the urine. So you might have, um, uh, you might have, free, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, frequency of urination, um, urgency of urination, uh, can't postpone, avoid, um, uh, things like that. Um, these can be present, you know, and separate from BPH, uh, uh, you know, in a diagnosis, for instance, of detrusor of activity, or they can coexist or be, sorry, the, or they can be caused secondary to uh, BPH. Um, then there are, you know, voiding symptoms, uh, which uh, are things that are more, you know, physical or mechanical in nature. You can think of it that way, um, you know, uh, actual slower stream. You know, you can think of it as, you know, the kinking of the water of the garden hose, you know, slower stream, um, uh, intermittency, uh, hesitancy, um, uh, what we call strangeuria. The patient de describes as straining, you know, when they attempt to void. Um, and then there's kind of post micturition type symptoms. They might have like, you know, post void dribbling or other things like that, um, you know, that, that can, uh, um, that can happen. Um, so, uh, you know, how do we, um, uh, you know, how do we uh, focus our objective evaluation? So that's the subjective part. And, um, you know, um, you know, this, uh, you know, we're going to focus on those three symptom areas when we talk to them, make sure that we elucidate all those items. Uh, and one way to do that quickly is using a symptom score. So the AUA symptom score, some sort of validated, is a validated measure that tells us that kind of evaluates all those areas. And, uh, you know, it's helpful in a few ways. Number one, I can look at the symptom score filled out by the patient and know exactly what I'm in for uh, without having to go through all those questions individually. Um, so it's, you know, it helps to expedite the evaluation, but it also helps to um, establish some um, uh, um, some reference point off of which we can compare our results of, of any type of intervention that we decide upon um, subsequent to that first consultation. Um, and so um, that's very helpful. And one major part of the AUA symptom score is the bother score. 
Um, so uh, that's the final question, and it will tell, and it will ask the man, or and you can, of course, uh, uh, women can be given the AUA symptom score as well. But of course, we're talking about BPH today, so you know it will ask, um, you know, essentially how how much are you bothered by this, and uh, if indeed uh, they are not bothered, um, that uh, you know that is very different and, and an important distinction despite the fact that they may be scoring off the charts on their symptoms, if it doesn't bother them, uh, then um, that's important uh, information, in fact, critical information. Um, one other way that we can evaluate this is using a boarding diary. Um, you know, if, if number one, it's unclear what's going on based on their inability to kind of, uh, you, know, you know, some patients just aren't very good at, um, at kind of distilling their experience and, uh, and communicating that to you in a timely fashion. Uh, uh, also, sometimes they have a lot of different symptoms that don't make much sense, in, uh, you know, just intuitively, and, uh, or, and or they could be just a complicated patient that, you know, can have multiple etiologies. It's not always simple, and so a voiding diary can break that down. There are also certain specific times when we use a voiding diary, and uh, I'll make sure to get, the, get to that. Um, uh, but it's not necessarily a requirement for every uh, evaluation for, for um, boarding dysfunction or, or boarding symptoms. Of course, the anatomy, um, you know, digital rectal exam, um, you know, we're going to evaluate prostate size, um, you know, in the, in, the, in the meantime, we'll be, you know, doing a prostate cancer screening, but, um, you know, uh, generally, you know, prostate cancer doesn't necessarily present with voiding symptoms. That's just kind of a part of, you know, what we're doing there. Um, but uh, of course, it's also important to do a neurologic exam, you know, as you can tell, you know, those storage, that storage component, um, and in fact, things like weak stream can be, uh, um, can be caused by neurologic problems just as well as they can by mechanical obstruction. And so, very important to determine that, especially if they give you any history that could suggest that that is a contributing factor, whether that's diabetes, you know, that's, you know, poorly controlled or insulin dependent or, you know, chronic uh, for a long period of time, um, history of neurologic disorder, um, other, you know, other just general neurologic abnormalities on the uh, review of systems. Um, you know, and it's not unheard of for a urologist to make the diagnosis of some neurologic disorders if they're paying close attention and the patient, you know, hasn't otherwise, you know, seen a doctor regularly. Um, so that's uh, important. Um, labs are an option. Um, you know, it's uh, in, in some cases, you know, the basic minimum would be a urinalysis. Okay, if patient has voiding symptoms. Uh, you know, what we're looking for is, is there an infection? Is there hematuria? Um, those are the main items there. Um, you know, not uh, imperative at the beginning, uh, but if there are other signs or symptoms that would lead us in this direction, we could be getting a basic metabolic panel looking for creatinine, uh, you know, their A1C, uh, you know, if, if we suspect, you know, if there's like glucose urea on the UA and they don't have a history of diabetes, for instance. Um, so that would be an example. Obviously, this can, path can go multiple ways. Um, PSA, you know, in the screening population, and you know, this isn't the the focus of this talk, but you know, screening population, 50 to 70, 55 to 70, and in general, uh, and uh, you know, so a guy comes in 84 years old with just basic, you know, obstructive symptoms. I'm not going to be necessarily checking a PSA on that man. So adjunct testing, um, post void residual, that's PVR. Um, that uh, and Euroflow are type of urodynamic tests that are you know sub sub subsections of the urodynamics. Technically, uh, when someone refers to urodynamics, they're usually referring to the full video pressure flow study, video urodynamics. But just know that PVR and Euroflow technically fall within that and are part of urodynamics and um, Post void residual is just a spot ultrasound check uh, of the uh, bladder, you know, post void, of course. Um, so that's easy to do in the office after they give us a urine sample. Euroflow is a little bit more, but still, still easy to do. And, you know, they, uh, you know, 
there's a flow meter that measures the speed of the flow and the amount of, uh, of um, the, the volume of the um, void and um, can tell us if the patient reach, reaches a low peak flow, which can be indicative of, uh, of uh, obstruction, but not uh, but is not diagnostic of obstruction as, you know, uh, poor bladder function, uh, you know, um, uh, um, can also cause the same type of dynamic. Um, and then, of course, urodynam full urodynamics, pressure flow study, you know, with or without video um, is another option if things are quite complex. You know, say the patient has, um, you know, Parkinson's. And, um, you know, it sounds pretty straightforward, but, you know, they're, neurologic condition is worsening. Uh, there's no reason to have them have a poor quality of life uh, just because they have Parkinson's disease. So oftentimes we'll do urodynamics and if it's straightforward and they have you know, you know, straightforward obstruction, it's totally reasonable to treat them just like anybody else, uh, clearly. Um, and then cystoscopy. Um, cystoscopy, you know, historically, especially in the guidelines and so forth, you know, uh, has not uh, has been explicitly stated as not necessary in the initial uh, evaluation of uh, BPH avoiding symptoms, but more and more it's starting to be involved as our treatment options uh, evolve. Um, a lot of the surgical treatment options that are out there uh, are are starting to require uh, cystoscopy up front um, as there are kind of you know uh, a more and more complex algorithm of uh, what procedures are good for what prostate anatomy and cystoscopic evaluation is often, often necessary. For example, Eurolift or Resume. Um, so, um, but uh, that's the main use. Cystoscopy cannot be used to measure the size of a prostate. You can measure the urethral length and have some sort of, sorry, the prostatic urethral length and have some sort of idea, but it doesn't give you a definitive size. Um, it doesn't give you definitive uh, test for obstruction, even if the loads are co-apting. That is a sign that there could be obstruction there, uh, but it's not um, given uh, just by seeing that. So those are a little bit, you know, myths that you might encounter, you know, that you're going to scope a person just to see if they have, you know, obstructive BPH. Technically, that's not correct. Um, but you know, you, you generally will learn a lot about um, you know if you're if you're looking to do a surgical intervention, um, you know you'll learn a lot that you need to know to plan that surgical intervention. Certainly, somebody who has had prior surgical interventions, uh, that is the one situation or one of the situations where cystoscopy is generally indicated. Um, you know, because you're looking for regrowth of the tissue, you're looking for you know what does the anatomy look like now compared to you know virgin anatomy. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, this was a, this is a note that I add for, you know, residents and, you know, folks who are in practice, that's important. Um, you know, uh, obviously this, you know, we're not, um, you know, shouldn't be in the business for worrying about billing, you know, alone, but that is something that's important. Um, and, uh, you know, the level of our evaluation, uh, leads to, you know, billing realities and pragmatics about that. And um, simply reviewing prior imaging uh, uh, does change actually how we can build the appointment and how complex the um, patient is assuming other uh, requirements uh, for that billing. But um, one important part about this clinically really is the uh, element of um, sizing the prostate. So it's one of the only ways, you know, especially cross-sectional imaging and MRI or CT of the pelvis uh, can give us the size of the prostate without having to do, for instance, you know, a truss or a transrectal ultrasound. Um, I mentioned, let me just uh, clarify what I was talking about with the voiding diary. Um, we'll use voiding diary specifically in a patient with um, nocturia. So a patient comes and they, you know, uh, it's not uncommon for a man to complain most about having to get up at night. Um, you know, they used to get up at night just once a, once a night or twice a night, it didn't bother them as much. Now they're getting up three, four times a night. Uh, but during the day, they don't have much of a problem. Okay. And then, um, you know, so, um, so I talked about that bother score, you know, that bother is very important. You know, um, if a man has a lot of symptoms and is not bothered, this is a quality of life diagnosis. And that's what I tell my patients, quality of life diagnosis. 
Um, if you want treatment, you can have it. If you don't want it, you shouldn't be treated. Um, so it, oftentimes that threshold is passed with nocturia. And so um, they're peeing at night and uh, they wanna know why and see if it can be helped. And uh, um, there are medical reasons for that that are outside of mechanical obstruction from, pro, uh, from uh, benign prostatic uh, enlargement. And so it's very important to rule those out. Um, you know, very common, you know, in the South, guys are large. Uh, what's one of those, you know, sleep apnea, okay? So a man with obstructive sleep apnea, not only will get up a lot of it at night, but also is associated with nocturia. So more specifically nocturnal polyuria. So it's important to evaluate these patients for that. And one way to start with that evaluation is with avoiding diary. Uh, and of course, you'll see that they, you know, avoid more than a third of their overall 24 hour urine volume at night, you know, from the time they go to bed to their first void in the morning. And that's abnormal. And um, you can evaluate that further with subsequent testing uh, that can be done by the urologist uh, before even referring them um, out. So um, other reasons for this can be um, uh, just general global polyuria, uh, concentrating abnormalities, you know. Um, so these are, um, these are things that we can evaluate with the tests that we have just in the clinic, um, you know, and, and basic laboratory tests. All right, so uh, what are the options that I give my patients? So we have a diagnosis of presumed, you know, uh, BPH or benign prostatic enlargement uh, with, uh, with lower urinary tract symptoms that are bothersome. Uh, I don't have a slide for this, but before I, you know, finish the evaluation talk, I'll say that there's one other uh, defining characteristic that needs to be um, you know, elucidated on the evaluation or, or, or explicitly addressed. And that is the element of, is this complicated BPH or non-complicated BPH? It doesn't necessarily make its way into the ICD coding system, but it's important to us uh, as clinicians uh, because I mentioned earlier that quality of life is important. Um, and that's really the distinguishing feature of how we go about recommending treatments to patients. The only caveat to that is if they have complicated BPH, okay? So uh, I don't much care if the, if, it's a patient, you know, if the patient's getting up twice a night and doesn't care himself. But I do care if he's getting up twice a, a night and keeps having urinary tract infections or has bladder stones um, or even worse, you know, has a, just a totally, you know, defunctionalized bladder and is having bilateral hydronephrosis and uh, chronic kidney disease from his BPH. We really care about that, and I'm not going to let the patient uh, leave without, you know, uh, strenuously recommending some treatment uh, in that scenario, uh, which is clearly different from someone with a simply, uh, um, you know, symptom symptomatic uh, abnormality that's related to quality of life only. Uh, so, you know, in those situations when you have complicated BPH, again. Uh, you know, uh, azotemia or, or uh, elevated creatinine um, uh, infections, recurrent, uh, really technically any urinary tract infections abnormal for a man, but certainly if they're recurrent. Um, and uh, um, stones, bladder stones are three examples of that. Um, in that situation, I'm not going to necessarily recommend, you know, some of these initial treatment options uh, because we need to go and be more, a little bit more aggressive sometimes because this is a treatable disease. I mean, this is one of the, the diseases that is the foundation of urology, in fact, uh, and, you know, in terms of the TERP you know, procedure and uh, what that means for us. Um, but um, you know, uh, you know, while I'm talking about medical therapy, it's very important to talk about the, this, the, to know as, a con you know as context of that, that surgical treatment, I mean, many urologists would say this is a surgical disease, not a medical disease. Uh, part of that is because a lot of, you know, uh, primary care docs and internal medicine docs know how to treat it. And so they only come to us as a surgical problem, but, um, but that's not necessarily the case. And uh, patients may self-refer and so forth. And it's not always appropriate to recommend surgery right away, um, but uh, it is certainly a disease that is uh, responsive to surgery. And uh, if properly diagnosed, very responsive to surgery and um, has, uh, you know, impressive outcomes in terms of patient satisfaction and quality of life improvement. So 
So that's the context of this. That, um, but that that said, that you know there are real you know options that are short of surgery, and many men don't want surgery initially, at least. For behavioral modifications, there are many things that we can recommend that they do at home, uh, short of starting a new medication or certainly surgery um, to improve their symptoms. Um, Double voiding, time voiding, that means you know, trying to empty your bladder as best you can. Their, their post void residual is a little high. Uh, you know, they may have frequency related to that, that you know, essentially every time they pee, they're going from a full glass to a half you know, full glass, and they need to try to do a little bit better job of emptying. Medication changes, um, you know, they may have uh, cert be taking medications for other, uh, other um, uh, problems. Uh, that may be interfering or the timing of their medication, you know, they're getting up a lot at night because they take their thiazide at night or something like that. Um, but usually that's not the case. Um, physical activity, um, you know, uh, as with anything, you know, sometimes uh, things get better just the healthier you get. Um, and then uh, avoiding bladder irritants, um, you know, diuretics if possible, like, ca you know, we're talking about like caffeine, alcohol, um, so, you know, these are all things that go into the basic kind of paragraph long discussion that general urologists have with their patients about trying to optimize their lifestyle for, uh, you know, addressing these quality of life issues that they've addressed or they've come to you with. Of course, nighttime fluid control, you know, um, I don't think I have this in this uh, slide deck, but um, I have a bladder diary of a patient um, that essentially it just shows that uh, start, you know, normal voiding and, uh, you know, intake, the, the bladder diary also has intake. So it has the more normal voiding and intake until like six o'clock. And then it's, and then every 30 minutes, it's like 12 ounces, uh, you know, and um, uh, 12 ounce intake, you know, 300 cc's void, 12 ounce intake, 300 cc void, 12 ounce intake, 300 cc void, till like 11 o'clock and then they they get up every two hours and void, you know, 350 cc's and then drink another eight ounces of intake. And so, you know, I talked to the patient, what's up with this? Like, well, I drink an eight, you know, I drink a six pack plus a beer every night and then I drink a full glass of water every time I get up to pee. You know, clearly, you know, um, that's something that we can fix without having to go much further than, uh, you know, just a simple discussion. All right, so what medicines do we have at our disposal? There's three main, uh, well, really four main families of medications, three main uh, modes of action. Uh, the first is alpha blockers. Um, these uh, relax the smooth muscle, the bladder neck. Um, there's such thing as non-selective alpha blockers and selective alpha blockers. You know, uh, you, uh, it's, you know, your more seasoned urologists kind of have a very good understanding of this because they were around and prescribing these medications as each one came out. So a lot of them kind of have a very you know, um, distinguished understanding of each uh, of the nuances of each one because they had a rep come in every time a new one came out and talked to them about the benefits of each one. And so it's our job now to now that they're all here to uh, to look look backwards and see. Uh, you know, but most of us get used to one or two and, and generally, you know, go back and forth, but it's important to know the uh, nuanced reasons why one might be better in a certain specific scenario. But um, to kind of, this is a theme, this is a recurrent theme of these medical therapies. And that goes back to the fact that, you know, uh, one might say this is a surgical disease uh, because ultimately the medical therapies do have a very mild to moderate effect uh, you know, emphasis on the mild uh, to, you know, symptoms and flow. So five milliliters per second increased flow, that's on the flow, flow meter, Euroflow um, portion of urodynamics studies, and then four point decrease in the, in the symptom score. You know, uh, an average symptom score is probably in the teens to 20s, you know, for these folks. So a four point decrease uh, can be argued whether or not this is a, you know, clinically meaningful. Um, but ultimately, you know, like I said, it's quality of life and it's a patient, you know, whether that's, a, you know, just, just simply a, um, a placebo effect, that's okay with me, you know, you know, I want my patient to be happy and, you know, I can send them back to their primary care doctor stable on their alpha blocker, that's fine with me. Um, 
some uh, side effects to warn them about. Um, some are, are dizzy, um, you know, uh, psilodocin uh, has less of that effect, more selective. Um, so that would be a good uh, option for somebody who has, um, who has some orthopnea or dizziness from taking tamsulosin, for instance. Uh, that's kind of my default, and a lot of people default tamsulosin, but that would be an alternative for somebody with that side effect. Rhinitis, again, alpha, alpha uh, relaxation, uh, and then retrograde ejaculation. This is a common one that we talk about a lot, but it's actually less common than you think um, in terms of actual percentages of men who experience it with this, but um, alphazosin tends to have less of this, so that's an alternative, although it can be expensive or difficult to get covered from the uh, from the patient's um, medical plan. The pharmacokinetics are, in, are interesting and different uh, for really all these medications. And so I'll show a chart later on that'll kind of elucidate that. But um, it's very, that's why it's good to get used to prescribing one because it can be com confusing if you don't have the chart on hand all the time. Um, five alpha reductase inhibitors. So they block the conversion of testosterone to DHT, dihydrotestosterone, and uh, Ultimately, the goal here and, uh, or the mechanism is decrease in prostate volume or one of the main mechanisms uh, and decrease in, therefore, in bladder outlet obstruction. Um, this is, uh, uh, as opposed to the alpha blocker, which has clinical onset within days to you know, a week or two, um, high alpha reductase inhibitors has clinical onset of three to six months. So you have to prepare the patient for that. They're not gonna see an immediate result and they need to take it consistently over time uh, to see the result. There are only really two versions, finasteride and dutasteride. And again, mo very modest increase uh, or improvement in flow, uh, very modest improvement in symptoms in general on average. And uh, there is about a 30% decrease in prostate volume. Um, over four years, uh, you know, uh, this, is, uh, this can lead to 50% re reduction in the risk of uh, urinary retention. Urinary retention is a fourth, uh, um, uh, is a fourth um, complication that can happen from BPH uh, retention episodes um, or and a, about a 50% re reduction in the need for surgery. Um, so MTOPS is one of the main studies that study 5-alpha reductase inhibitors and in that study about 8% of men uh, reported erectile dysfunction. Now uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken that was a placebo controlled study and they had a similar report from the folks with placebo. So, uh, you know, the sexual function um, um, uh, side effects of 5 alpha reductase inhibitors are reported, um, but there's some question as to whether or not they're um, real, but um, certainly that's an option to, you know, withhold it if it's not making a big difference, but is causing sexual dysfunction, um, you know, and so, um, one, uh, you know, uh, one thing you may think, well, these are two different medications. Um, you know, what if we use it in combination? So, um, generally, uh, you know, obviously, so eight, eight, uh, the threshold of eight, eight UA symptom scores, threshold of mild to moderate, um, symptoms and, um, you know, just a basic principle of, you know, prescribing medication for quality of life type disorder is, you know, start easy, you know, get a little bit more uh, aggressive as needed. And um, so of course, you're not necessarily gonna start off right off the bat with a combination therapy and somebody with very mild symptoms or mild bother, but for somebody with moderate or severe symptoms who doesn't want surgery, um, it's reasonable and uh, to, to start off right off the bat with both a 5-alpha reduction inhibitor and a, and, and a alpha blocker. Um, of course, they should warrant the treatment um, using a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor isn't a, uh, really necessary for somebody with a normal sized prostate, um, but uh, for somebody with an enlarged prostate, it's a good option. Uh, it's not synergistic, but it is additive in terms of uh, better risk reduction than either, either um, medication alone. Um, and uh, so, so uh, decreased progression to complicated BPH. Uh, and it's also been found, in fact, to be more cost-effective than monotherapy. Anticholinergics, um, there is, uh, you know, anticholinergics uh, work to, uh, of course, uh, uh, decrease the overactivity of the bladder uh, through uh, modulation of the parasympathetic system. Um, and 
Um, and that is where uh, a lot of the side effects come into play. Um, there's not any significant difference in flow or you know, urodynamics because of that. Um, and in fact, actually, um, you know, some studies have shown that there's not actually that much significant difference in the post void residual after anticholinergics was a little bit uh, counterintuitive because in fact, you will see that the, you know, that it's actually not recommended to give them in folks with higher post void residuals due to the, you know, uh, theoretical risk of uh, putting them into retention due to, you know, uh, decreasing, the, uh, 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 decreasing the contractility of the bladder. Uh, but in fact, the, the retention rate is very low um, and, um, uh, and it does uh, do, again, a uh, modest improvement in symptoms. Uh, and um, uh, it is a better in combination with alpha blockers. Um, side effects, uh, these are the primary side effects, dry mouth in a, in a majority of men, uh, constipation and blurry vision. Um, I say men again, just because this is a uh, talk about DPH, but of course these are given to women as well. Uh, one of the new and developing areas in this uh, type of med in this medication uh, is um, in this medication family is uh, concerned that it uh, can uh, develop um, problems with dementia uh, when given over uh, longer periods of time. Uh, so the data there is concerning, and so um, there is uh, you know reasonable um, you know. Uh, um, uh, motivation there to really stop giving these types of medications in somebody otherwise at risk for dementia um, and uh, even just simply uh, age, which as you can imagine, a lot of these patients uh, are in advanced age uh, categories. And so this can be a little tricky of, an, of a medication to prescribe. So a good alternative is, um, well, sorry, this is a re- I'm going to go back to this is a beta three agonist. So beta three agonist, mirabet, there's only one mirabetric or mirabegron, and uh, it is thought to relax the detrusor. Although we don't have a great understanding of the of the, of the um, uh, mechanics of this, um, uh, decrease some of the storage symptoms. Uh, there really are not many adverse symptoms that have been reported. So that uh, sounds too good to be true, and uh, it is because it's very expensive. Um, PE5 inhibitors, okay, so these are your sildenafil, you know, tadalafil, Viagra, Cialis, all that kind of stuff. Um, uh, you know, uh, if you didn't expect to hear that in a BPH talk, it is something that's been going on for a little while, but it's not kind of part of the repertoire, I would say, of, of all established primary care docs out there in terms of treating their patients with BPH. But as you can imagine, a lot of these patients have coincident erectile dysfunction. And so it's a good option if they can afford it. Um, and luckily, tadalafil uh, is uh, you know now generic. And so you know um, tadalafil uh, uh, being uh, Cialis and you know the uh, with a longer half life. And so it's more fitting to give for this indication uh, rather than like a sildenafil, which only has effect for about five hours. So uh, four to nine point decrease in symptoms, similar again to the other medications. Uh, it's FDA approved at the five milligram dose of tadalafil. And um, although all um, um, doses have shown benefit, and uh, that's the lowest dose, by the way. Um, and the uh, you know, side effects of PD5 inhibitors, um, which we can give in a later talk, I think someone's given erectile dysfunction is headache, dyspepsia, flushing, um, all due to similar mechanism. All right, so uh, uh, you know, what are the situations you can find yourself in? You got a guy with small prostate and a lot of symptoms. Um, you know, that may just be simple overactive detrusor or something like that. So initial therapy though is good for an alpha blocker, although you can add an anticholinergic or a beta agonist in, in patients uh, and do a combination therapy. Somebody with large prostate, so benign prostatic en enlargement and symptoms, especially, you know, just classic obstructive, obstructive symptoms, you can start them with moderate, you know, uh, symptom level on a combination therapy, uh, or you can do one or the other. Uh, again, if you start with a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor, it's going to take a little bit longer for it to take action, so it's important to warn the patient about. Um, one might wonder, you know, you reduce the size of the prostate, and patients, a lot of patients ask this, in fact, with 5-alpha reductase inhibitor, reduce the size of the prostate, 
Uh, in fact, that leads to, uh, you know, we roughly estimate a cut in the PSA of, of a half by half. And so once you start a patient on a 5 alpha reductase inhibitor, it's important to know, you know, when you check their PSA, that you got to adjust for that, okay? Not if they've been on for two weeks, but if they've been on, you know, for six months, uh, years, you know, you and their PSA is three and a half, it might look good, but really their PSA is seven. And so, you know, depending on the clinical situation, it might warrant further investigation there. And so uh, from a prostate cancer screening standpoint, it's important to note, uh, but it has been studied and uh, in PD5, um, sorry, 5 alpha reductase inhibitors are not protective against prostate cancer. You know, I tell patients that, you know, PSA is like a road sign. It doesn't actually, you know, uh, uh, you know, it doesn't, it just gives us an indicator of, you know, whether cancer could be pre present. It, do it doesn't, uh, you know, help to modulate it itself. It doesn't improve, um, you know, your risk or, of, of cancer development. Any cholinergic um, uh, can be added, you know, even to the combination therapy of alpha blocker, 5-alpha reductase inhibitor, um, you know, but at that point, you know, if their symptoms are that bad, you know, you're probably doing that to try to avoid surgery in an otherwise poor surgical candidate, perhaps, um, rather than, um, you, know, you know, a lot of those patients, if they progress that far, you might be best served recommending a surgical alternative. Uh, but, uh, you know, monotherapy for a PD-5 and with a PD-5 inhibitor is reasonable in a patient who has uh, concomitant uh, ED, of course. Um, you know, uh, here's the uh, chart. This comes from the AUA core curriculum. Um, so maybe it's a little dubious to show this, but yeah, um, the, uh, it's important to have this reference point of, uh, you know, just in general, the medications you prescribe as a physician that yeah, it's, that's something that was, you know, uh, maybe challenging and maybe felt like a little bit over, um, you know, um, uh, over detailed in your earlier, you know, studies, but, uh, you know, pharmacokinetics is important. Um, and the, um, in this particular case, you can see the variation, uh, you know, in uh, even within the same family, tamsulosin, there's a 30% decrease in area under the curb uh, with food and with alphazosin, there's a 50% increase in taking the food. Um, so that's important to know. Um, and, uh, you know, patients, you know, has some effect, but not, you know, great. You know, they come back to you two months later after starting the medication. Well, hey, you know, maybe you should, uh, you know, uh, take it not with your meals, you know, if you're on Blomax, for instance. Um, and uh, you might see another little bump for them. Um, which is beneficial, of course, you know, uh, one thing that, you know, is, uh, you know, commonly known here is that uh, sildenafil, uh, of course, should be taken on an empty stomach, and this is the reason um, uh, to dialfil, you know, alternatively, you know, doesn't have that, um, you know, change in the, uh, in the, in the um, area under the curve there. So, um, important to have these ideas, and this kind of puts together all the adverse effects together with you, uh, for you. Um, uh, for, you know, in terms of all these different types of medications, um, you know, and uh, some of these, you especially you can see here in the, um, in the anticholinergic, you know, uh, medications, look how, look how, um, you know, significant amount of patients have some side effect. Um, and, uh, you know, so sometimes these are not very well tolerated uh, um, So a little, a couple, um, you know, fine points, you know, maybe this is, this is probably actually more practical and used too, but herbals have not been, there's no studied herbal that's been shown to have, uh, you know, actual benefit. Um, uh, Sal palmetto is a common one that's used just for prostate issues or, you know, prostate cancer prevention, prostate issues in patients. Uh, no evidence to date. Um, the, this is going back to that idea of, um, of semantics, you know, um, uh, and, uh, you know, while you can pass it off as semantics, it's also important uh, to be uh, precise when you're talking about these things. So let's lower urinary tract symptoms, uh, um, um, bladder outlet obstruction, BOO, uh, benign prostatic obstruction, benign prostatic hypertrophy or hyperplasia, and then benign prostatic enlargement. I think benign prostatic enlargement, you know, in the clinic, 
you know, things you can definitely make a diagnosis of benign prostatic enlargement. Because uh, while we're not great at estimating a gram size of the prostate, we can definitely say if it's enlarged uh, and lower urinary tract and symptoms, lower urinary tract symptoms. Obstructive symptoms, you know, have to be made technically by uh, urophilometry uh, plus a pressure flow study. Um, and generally, we don't just do a routine pressure flow study in the office. Um, so that's a little harder to make with uh, um, confidence. Um, of course, BPH, again, theoretically, is a histologic diagnosis. And so, you know, when you do their simple prostatectomy, you can say BPH afterward, but technically, if you want to be correct, um, saying it, you know, on the initial consultation is inaccurate. Uh, or at least, um, you know, not, you know, can't say it with confidence. Um, this is probably a little bit beyond what you need to worry about. Um, uh, this too, you know, uh, it does cause a little bit of bump, uh, finasteride and, and testosterone, not, the, not, not enough to use to treat it, but um, to treat, I mean, to, uh, to be more precise, to treat low T. Um, and intraoperative floppy iris syndrome. So um, that's probably something that you've seen in, you know, uh, early testing that's, uh, you know, about alpha blockers. Um, there's some, um, you know, I would say anecdotally, uh, I've had ophthalmologists not, you know, be very concerned about this, uh, but nevertheless, it's important to know that um, it exists and that patients that have uh, concomitant um, cataracts should not be placed on alpha blockers until you've had some uh, plan uh, for their treatment of their cataracts and that, you know, we're sure that it's not going to interfere their, their medical therapy for their, you know, other quality of life, you know, problem is not going to interfere. There are algorithms that are out there um, and, uh, you know, for, for treating this, again, you know, things like, you know, the polyuria element is important to, to note, um, but, uh, you know, I've kind of gone over this systematically so far, but um, note the complicated LUTs uh, algorithm goes straight to specialized management. And this, if you're not a urologist, is the part you need to know. When do we want to see the patient? Definitely when we're starting to see these things. Uh, the other things theoretically could be managed by a non-urologist um, and, and should be um, in many cases. Um, and then uh, management for bothersome uh, LUTs after basic management, after basic, uh, after their basic, you know, medical management. Um, this is where, you know, things can get complicated and whatnot, but this is something that uh, you can look at later. So that's all for, for uh, medical BPH. I'm happy to answer any questions if you have them. Um, if not, uh, we really appreciate you guys uh, taking your time to um, uh, to be with us on this series. Um, you know, it's important for us in a period of time where it's difficult for us to uh, interact with medical students, you know, um, the, especially visiting students, it's hard to, uh, uh, you know, um, hard to make a choice of where you might want to go or what, what, uh, uh, what locations, what uh, programs may be interesting to you. Um, you know, maybe you're developing your interest in urology, but, um, you know, uh, yeah, you know, the, um, the, certainly the clinical experience is, is, is variable at best in terms of what we can predict in the near future. So I think it's very important and, uh, and worthwhile uh, to, to get involved in any way you can uh, with uh, these types of lectures and, and get some more understanding of, you know, the dynamics of any given urology department and also um, just kind of beef up on your uh, urology experience, see if it's something that you're interested in long term. I'll pause and let me see. Uh, you're also welcome to throw it in the, actually, I think we turned the chat off for this. So there is no chat, but um, welcome to unmute yourself and ask a question. If not, we'll uh, close it. And uh, I think uh, Dr. Maida has an upcoming talk uh, later this week. Hi, Dr. Lawrence. Yes. Uh, I just have a quick question regarding uh, uh, your point for patients with BPH on 5 ARIs and prostate screening. Yeah. 
Um, how does it affect uh, interpretation of PSA velocity if a patient has like concomitant BPH when you're doing screening? Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of adjunct ways that we look at prostate cancer screening and velocity is one of them. Um, you know, density probably is even better. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's hard to calculate the velocity, especially if some in some, you know, the period, given period of time that you're looking at um, their PSAs, they went on or came off their, um, you know, their uh, um, 5-alpha reductase inhibitors. So, um, you know, the best thing, you know, one thing that we advise patients in general and as part of the, you know, AUA guidelines, in fact, is that uh, really high frequency screening is not recommended. So uh, what can throw you off is the guy who comes in with Q3 month PSAs you know, and it's really hard to interpret those because PSA in of itself is pretty volatile uh, sometimes. And so sometimes the best, you know, response to an initial consultation is a recheck. But, um, but yeah, it can be challenging as there's no de definitive way and there's no definitive threshold of velocity that's, you know, um, that's, um, uh, that's worrisome or not necessarily, uh, you know, probably a good rule of thumb is about two nanograms per milliliter in a year uh, is something that needs to be, you know, clinically addressed um, with a biopsy or an MRI or some other, uh, you know, um, evaluation tool for beyond screening. But uh, you have to take into account that, um, you know, number one, the, you know, the medication is going to cut, cut the PSA in half. And number two, that's going to take three to six months to fully manifest. And so if they're getting their PSA checked halfway through that period, it's really hard to interpret where are they? Have, have, has their PSA fully dropped yet? You know, but you certainly can say that if their PSA was already borderline, you know, they got a PSA of four and a half, and then four months after taking their, you know, finasteride, it's still four and a half. They're a little concerned, you know, I might check that PSA a little sooner than normal. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Sure. Hey, Dr. Lawrence. Um, I appreciate you uh, presenting um, this information. So thank you, first off. Yeah, um, and then my question, and this question kind of has a bunch of caveats, so feel free to answer it the best way that you can. But yeah. um, you mentioned that primary care providers are often first line in providing medical management for symptoms of um, benign prostatic um, enlargement. Um, so do you find that the majority of your patients in clinic present after some type of failure of outpatient treatment with like a primary care provider? And then as a follow-up to that, you know, what type of conversations are you having with these patients in your clinic? Are you giving them, you know, the whole burrito and saying, you know, there, here are surgical options, here's continuation of medical management, or are you just saying, you know, let's work with what you have and go from there? Yeah, so I guess two main area, two main questions there. One, do uh, you know what 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 in my experience have I seen? You know what what kind of spectrum of patients do I see at what stage in their treatment? And two, uh, how how you know how do you go about the counseling? Do I like load up this PowerPoint and show it to them, or do I tell them you need to do this? Well, um, in terms of the spectrum of you know you know stations that the patient will come in in terms of their treatment, uh, it's quite variable usually they have tried something in the past, whether that's because from a prior urologist 10 years ago and they can't remember the name or they're on Flomax or something like that. Usually they've tried something, you know, because like I said, most primary care doctors have some working understanding of some of the basics uh, that you've already seen here. So, um, but that's not always the case, you know, especially if they have poor access to care or, you know, just some people have that conception that, you know, the urologist is the male, you know, gynecologist and they just come to you thinking that you're a primary care doc. I wouldn't say that's the typical thing, but it can happen. And in that case, you're starting from scratch oftentimes. Um, but, you know, and that leads to the counseling aspect. Number one, you know, how do I evaluate those patients who've come in some, you know, intermediate stage, whether they've, you know, tried or maybe tried and number one, you know, you, you know, it's totally guided on, do they have complications? Do they have bother or severe bother or not. Uh, if they have a lot of bother or complications, uh, I'm going to push them. I'm going to not going to talk about a lot of this, that the early part of that, you know, talk. I'm going to be talking about surgery. I'm going to be talking about, you know, especially if they're surgical candidates, of course. Um, but, uh, you know, if they're, um, you know, and I try to get an idea for their kind of personality. Do they, 
are they averse to surgery or not? You know, are they averse to medications or not? And um, that plays a lot into it. So I try to ask some of those elucidating questions about those things if I can't already get an idea from their history. Uh, but it's not really a useful, uh, you know, use of your time to give them the whole thing. You know, um, theoretically, you want to discuss in general all of their treatment options. Um, that can be delivered in a variety of ways. You can do that verbally. You can give them a handout that has all that information in it. It's just important that they know it um, and that they're aware that they're out there. So if I say, you know, you have low severity symptoms, I recommend you either do behavioral symptoms or just try one medication. By the way, surgery is out there if all this doesn't work, but I don't recommend it at this stage. That's what I'll say. I don't really even go into any of the detail there. Awesome, thank you very much. Sure. Hi, Dr. Lorenz. Um, I had a question about the PDE5 inhibitors that you had sure. discussed. Um, so I know that for a lot of folks, they might be on that for pre-existing ED. So if someone did come in with symptoms of, um, of BPH while also on ED, would you discontinue that medication or would you consider like a combination of therapies after that? Um, uh, maybe I'm misunderstanding the question, but uh, you know, I think that this continuation would only be uh, recommended if they, if, if it was ineffective for the, you know, indicated problem. So, you know, if they were getting some benefit out of it for their erections, then I wouldn't discontinue it. But yeah, I mean, I would probably add another medication um, uh, you know, to it to treat their their uh, voiding symptoms. Um, if they came in with severe voiding symptoms, you know, might recommend a surgery, but then um, keep them on for their erections. Or, you know, certainly if they already have erectile dysfunction, you know, you want to steer them in a direction that's not going to make that worse as best you can. Now, but again, if if it's not working for either, then yeah, I would stop it and kind of start from scratch. I guess I also should be, should have been more explicit. Um, is there any combination of therapies that you wouldn't recommend um, prescribing together? Uh, theoretically, you know, um, like a you know mirror background, like a beta agonist and an anticholinergic. Theoretically, like right off the bat, you don't want to do because again, you know, there's the concern that you can put the patient to retention. But you can do dual therapy on you know with those uh, two medications. Um, you know, but it's important, to, you know, you wanted to monitor their post foy residual on the way yeah, and monitor them for the other kind of side effects, of course. Um, in terms of the, you know, all the different families of medications, you know, alpha blocker, PDE5, 5-alpha five, five reductase, you know, you can theoretically put them on all of them. You know, there's not really any combination there, no, that, uh, that I would say there's some contraindication between the two. Um, course, there's going to be little contraindications for some of these medications in terms of their other medications, but, uh, you know, uh, PD-5 inhibitor and, um, you know, uh, some sort of ART, uh, sorry, um, some sort of, uh, you know, HIV medication or something like that. You got to, you know, dose appropriately and all that, but um, not within the medications I discussed today. Thank you. Sure. Well, it's been a pleasure. It's five minutes after our time here.